Hello and welcome to the Westside Barbell Podcast. Today's episode is delivered in a different format, containing a series of unaired question and answers with Louis Simmons. Our production team found and recovered these media files while reviewing our back catalogue of content for an upcoming project. The questions are varied and the answers contain helpful information. I truly hope you enjoy consuming the genius and the humour that made Louis Simmons, well, that made him Louis. Uh, Adam wants to know if your big focus is the deadlifts and your biggest weakness on the deadlifts is starting strength off the floor. What squat variation would you include on max effort day? He uh, deadlifts conventional. He uses a duck stance and his back is definitely his strength. His legs are his weakness. He's alternating squat and deadlifts weekly on max effort day with plenty of deficits on deadlift week. Thanks again, Adam. Hi, Adam. Well, one thing I do a lot of low box squats, and uh, I know you say you, uh, it sounds like you use a close stance when you do your squats. Take your stance out ultra wide a lot and do some reps and blow up your glutes. And um, that will, but just the leg drive out of the bottom. Um, I had a guy here who took his deadlift in 14 weeks at the bench stuff for a year from 840 to 890 and a 242s. It's official to me. And what I did was, it's a program I put a lot of people, I took a girl from, uh, 350 to 425, 350 to 525 in a year. But I put him on a four inch box conventional. Each week he would add weight, five sets of five. On the fourth week, we used four inch boxes, went sumo. And he would start with, we'll say, five, 500, 525, 550. Then on, on the next three week cycle, we used a 10 inch box with a five inch camber deadlift bar. So when you stand on the box, your hands is about two or three inches lower than the ground. So you squat all the way down and grab that bar and use your legs to start it out there so the transition from your legs into your back is superb. And that's and I always ask, well, what was the best thing you did? And uh, it was uh, David Jenkinson. He said the, the camber bar deadlifts is what was the main thing to teach him leg drive. But people stand on boxes and never use their legs. They think it's a back exercise. They're wrong. It's a TG, use your legs. Olympic lifters years ago in the old Soviet Union and everywhere else, would stand on boxes to do their pulls, and you know they don't stiff leg pull. They, they, you know, they squat the weight up. And uh, also, I don't know, you didn't mention anything, but definitely start doing a lot of hamstring work, especially um, you know standing up because it'll work the hamstring behind the knee. And at, at the beginning, in the beginning of the deadlift, it's behind the knee that has to extend to get the weight off the ground. And also train your stomach up as much as you possibly can. And I, I think those things right there might trigger your deadlift back into, uh, move, you know, moving back up. And don't max, you know, if you're going to max out, max out on boxes. Don't try a regular deadlift for maybe about 12 weeks. Then jump in, you know, where you're mentally alert and then try and see if you won't move it. Okay? The next question comes in from Brian. Uh, hello, my name is Ryan. Uh, thank you for all the work and content you guys put out. My question is on neck training. What exercises and rep ranges do you like for neck training and also for restoration? I have had eight concussions and have to constantly work on my neck to keep it in good shape um, for training. I currently use bands and work the front side and back and 45 degrees front and back changing band height daily, using two variations of head harnesses to reduce accommodation. I also use a head weight hanging off a bench and use a similar to reverse hyper, but for the neck. I start the week with lower volume and higher band tension, increase the, or 50 reps, and increase it to 200 reps by Friday and Saturday. Any other recommendations would be appreciated. Thanks, Ryan. Hi, Ryan. Well, we've got a really good four-way neck machine we use. Um, Chuck Vogelpohl, years ago, at a body weight of 220, had a 22 and a half inch neck. Is that the side of the neck looked like triceps. And basically, at that time, the major thing he did was, was manual, where you'd have a partner hold his head down with a towel or push it down, you know, all four directions. He, and, and basically, static work, you know, static, then over, he would move it at the end of every rep. But that really made a big difference. One of my favorite neck exercises was actually, I would take a sled with a neck harness, hook it up, and uh, bend over and stand up with the sled. And I would, as I would stand up, then I would, as I'm walking backwards, I let the weight of the sled pull me back down. 
then I'd pick it back up. Now you can't use a lot of weight, you know, a plate or maybe two plates, uh, and um, but that constant tension for like 180 feet a set really would blow my neck up. And I never had like a pretty neck, but I had a big neck. And I always thought that's one of the things I liked it because it was at the same time I was building my lower back all the way up to my neck. And um, I think John Clinch said he'd never seen one of the development of the upper part of my neck that, that I had. And I think it's just, you know, from lifting and, uh, uh, but a lot of the good mornings on that uh, neck harness with that. But um, there's all kinds of things you can do. You know, like I said, this neck bridge, I know wrestlers every day, they get up and they do five minutes of neck bridges. So, you know, I would start switching around a little bit. It's not like you're doing a lot of stuff, but if you're not making progress, if you don't think you are, you need to add a few new things in, like you said, so more, uh, to, to um, you know, reduce the law of accommodation that you say you don't have, but maybe you do because, you know, you listed exercises. We just need to add a couple more in, take a couple out. You know, there's only, there's only like 18 inches in that bottle, 18 ounces. You can't put 20. So you don't want to overtrain. So get rid of a couple things and that's the new ones. Okay. How important would trap training be in addition to neck training? A uh, trap training is real important, Tom. Uh, you know, a lot of heavy shrubs. I've tried to get my guys in this gym for five years to do heavy, you know, they're called shoulder shrubs. Take a high pin. I'm talking 800. Pull it up with your arms, you know. <laughs> but no one ever did. But uh, I, we used to do a lot of that years ago. And a lot of trap, like upright rows. A lot of trap training. Yes, absolutely. What was Traps that? connect into your neck. What was that exercise? I can't think of the guy's name, but you sat on the bar. You the high shrug. High shrug. What, can you explain where that came from and what that is? Yeah, uh, Bob Heiss years ago uh, traveled the country and he, you know, he'd ride the rails. I mean, back when people did that in the 30s and 40s and 50s, and he'd jump off, go to the guy's house, and pull 700 pound deadlift. And one thing he did was uh, he was massive, had a massive chest, uh, like circumference wise. He put a bar in his back and he would breathe those chests. And then shrug, like this, and he got monstrously big. And the reps, you know, he would use 50 to 70 reps a set. You get enormously big, all that breathing. Very good for any athlete, too, uh, for air consumption. But uh, you just, you've got to breathe in the chest and then shrug. Breathe in the chest and shrug. Don't let anywhere air out, if possible. Keep as much in as you can. Keep taking big gulps of air. And it's a real uh, a chest expander, which you never hear anyone talk about anymore. And uh, it's a you know rib rib expander and a chest expander, and it will make you big. And it's it's tons of shrugs. You know we did it with the safety squat bar, which I like real well. Okay, the next question comes in from Jonathan. Hey Lou, hey Tom. I've been a member of the country club for seven months now and see my numbers go through the roof. So thank you for providing the content and programming. I have two questions I wanted to ask you about. Uh, first one is when to add squat briefs to training. And should they be used on both dynamic and max effort days? That's the first question. Hi, John. Uh, most of the time, we always wear briefs when we box squat, you know, uh, on speed day, on dynamic day. We always wear them. Uh, they sumo deadlift most of the time in briefs. A couple of guys don't, but most of them do. On max effort day, we seldom wear any briefs. Uh, we just, just don't wear them. And, uh, you know, we do the work without briefs. And we pull a lot of sleds and so forth. So, you know, you get a lot of work. On the muscles and the briefs aren't doing like you know if they are supporting gear on a dynamic day so uh, i hope that answers that uh, eric would like to know how often should he vary the speed doubles in squatting and deadlifting speed triples in the bench as opposed to the five by five sets should he stick to one or the other or switch back and forth for different dynamic effort uh, waves well, Eric, we have switched to five by five in the squat, and we broke four world records doing it. Uh, I took uh, Wesley McCormick. He had uh, he squatted 900 at 165. We put him on the five by fives, and he uh, lifted in the 181, squatted 955. That's the second biggest squat of all time. And we've got great success by doing this. And basically, you're, you're under muscle tension longer with the five by fives. Um, you know, if you did curls, if you do two reps or five reps, you want big arms. You know, you're not getting enough muscle tension, too. A lot of people have asked me why I switched. I started doing this in 1982. Back in 1982, before many were born, the rap on powerlifters said we were slow, and they were right. So I said, well, how can I get fast? That's why I went to the Soviet training, and it was used by weightlifters. There's no powerlifting then. It's weightlifters and track and field. And uh, so I did the speed strength training, and that's how we picked up our speed. But then later on, as uh, this all was accomplished by doing his training, we didn't need to do the two-by-twos two anymore. 
And so that's why we go five by fives. And we train at 80, 85, and 90 percent. We've had tremendous success with this. It's, a, it's 25 squats. It's followed by 25 deadlifts. On that same day, 80 percent, 85, 90 percent. If you're training on boxes, which we do most of the time, take the percent off that box record, not your deadlift. If your deadlift is 700 and your, and your box deadlift is 625, you got to take it off to 625. All right? So I hope that answers that question. Was, was that the, that was in the, in the bench? Yes, bench. Uh, and the bench, you know, we did a lot of triples, but we've also done as many six by six uh, reps. So it depends, you know, like, um, you know, Greg Panora, when he wasn't close to a meet, we always made Greg do six by six. Plus, we put 10 pound ankle weights on his, on his uh, wrist. And uh, that had great success. It took his bench way up from the sixes to the eights in, in his shirt. And uh, he, I watched him take out 570 himself and bench it raw. So it definitely worked for him. So, you know, you can use any of these reps. A lot of people worry about slowing down. When a barbell slows down, you create greater force. So don't worry about being slowing down somewhat. You know, actually, most of the lifts you look about like your opener in a contest. Uh, I would use that parameter to decide how fast your lift should be. But, um, you know, super fast, you don't produce any force. Objects in fast velocity with small weight produce small force. Large objects in slow velocity produce great force. The greatest force you can develop is isometrically. The barbell's not moving at all. It's at zero velocity. All right? That's where you produce the greatest force isometrically. When they test your absolute strength, they test it isometrically, not by how much you bench squat or deadlift. All right? So I hope that answered that question. The next question is a pretty good follow-on from this. comes in from John. And John wants to know about the 5x5 five five sets, too, for Dynamic Effort Day. And he's in comparison to what he read in the Book of Methods. He's starting out. So should he start out with what you wrote in the Book of Methods or start out with 5x5? Five when it comes to dynamic effort work? Well, I believe I wrote the Book of Methods in 2007. It's 2020. I, my car is newer than 13 years old, and I hope yours is too. So you've got to keep up with the times. The problem of human beings, the major problem is they're afraid to change. You have to change. Um, when you use these five by fives at 80, 85, and 90 percent, 33 percent approximately should be band tension. The rest, weight. All right? Uh, and that's what we're doing right now, making phenomenal progress by doing this. Um, listen, and as the weight grows up, you know, if you go from 700 to 800, of course, the band tension at 800, which would be 33%, would slowly reduce itself as the barbell weight would increase itself. But once you make eight, then readjust it at that point. All right, go back to the 33%. Um, I've got a girl squat 730. She trains at 250. So she has slightly over 33%. All right. So basically, that's how you do it. And we started with 140, which you could squat like, uh, you know, 400. And then we went to uh, 210, and now it's grown to um, uh, 250 pounds of tension. And we also took our circumax weights way up, like Wesley McCormick with the 900 squat would use 440 for circumax weight, a band tension, all right, and plus weight. But we took it to 640 and made an enormous increase. Same thing with, with the girl, Shanae. Uh, we were, when she was using 140, we used 250 for circa max, slow the barbell down, near maximum. All right, and, but now we use 440 for her. She's actually exceeded that because now she has done um, uh, 455 pounds of 440 band. So now we have to increase the band tension somewhere. Band tension must be greater than the bar weight, slow the bar down to build strength speed, slow strength. That's what our sport is. And to follow up with that, even though you've um, updated, as you should, the dynamic effort percentages in Circa Max, there is still a lot of relevant information in the Book of Methods that still holds true today. Oh, absolutely, yes. Yes, and 80% of your training should be on small exercises. You know, it's all about building up the volume on one day. If you cannot do this program, you are out of shape. I can tell you, I don't have to guess about this. I can tell you straight up, you are out of shape. If you can't do a program five by five for a, we'll say a 700 squat, you can't squat 700. You have no base, you go to meet, time you get in the squat or dead. You wonder why you can only do one bench and one dead because your GPP is low and you can't get through the meet. Make You have to at least, the old rule of thumb, you got to make at least six attempts back when powerlifting actually had competitors. Now you've got your only one in your class. But back then you had to have do six attempts or you weren't going to win a major meet. So you got to have GPP. So you better be able to do this program. I suggest when you're done, you pull some sleds or push some more barrels and get yourself in shape. Not that you're not, John, but that's the idea. I've got guys that's not in shape. 
and they're not here no more. That's all I've got to say. At 52, were there any exercises you steered clear of because you found them hard on your joints? Uh, hi, Bill. No, I actually did more workouts. Uh, what I found as I got older, uh, I had to do more workouts. I did a lot more small workouts for soft tissue as well. Lower back, elbows, knees, um, neck, and shoulders. That kept me in the ball game. Actually, at 52, I had the second best squat in the, in the, in the uh, world. And uh, at 54, I had the sixth best bench. And at 57, the 10th best deadlift. And also at 52, I had the four best total. So really, as I got older, I actually got better. And I, had a, a, um, you know, I came across a lot of serious injuries, two severe broken lower backs, which I repaired myself, ruptured patella tendon. I have no biceps and so forth. And, um, and then I managed to even continue till I was 63 when I did 730, 505, and 675 win 217. So what I did, I just did more soft tissue workouts. Uh, a lot of sled work, you got to stay in shape. Uh, you know, if you look at buffaloes out in the desert, the old buffalo gets left behind the one gets aged by the lions. So as soon as you get left behind, you're done. So my recommendation to you, if you can, and it can only be as, as short as 20 minutes, just GPP, maybe pull sleds, go in and do a lot of push-ups. Push-ups are one of the most valuable things people can do because it rotates the scapula. It also teaches a person uh, to push yourself away from a barbell instead of a barbell away from you. And um, so uh, that's what I just recommend, a lot of small workouts. All right, next question comes from Luke. Luke asks, my question is about boxing. I'm watching all the content on MMA. I was wondering how you would tweak this MMA training to approach boxes. Well, hi, Luke. Uh, one thing I would do, we do a lot of work in our uh, ATP. We place a, a, a belt around our waist with some band tension through the machine, and then we do shadow sparring in there and grappling, a lot of pommeling. All right? Uh, for punching power, uh, what we've done, we always work on the hips and glutes. We do not work on the arms. We may do elbows out extensions to build up the elbow right around, but we, you know, you of course don't want bigger arms. So we just work on the on the elbow joints itself. But if you want to develop more punching power, hook a band up to a rack, place it around the upper thigh, and when you throw the punch, because it's all hip rotation, by put, putting that around the hip, it'll build up more power and increase your arm speed and arm uh, force. All right, next one comes from Carlos. Carlos says, I'm a 14-year-old wrestler. I've never really lifted weights. Where should I start this offseason? Uh, Carlos, uh, if I was you and I was 14 years old, I would start with a sled. I would do a lot of upper body sled work with a second strap. Any exercise you can think of, always put your mind in sled work, whatever the sport is. You can even act like you're pommeling with that sled. But uh, a lot of upper back, you know, you need a strong upper back. And uh, but sled pulling, walking forward, for instance, also builds the hips and the glutes. So that's what I would do. You could uh, also for conditioning, you could go up to, um, you know, um, 400 meter walks at a time, maybe two or three of them with different type of weights. And um, and uh, but I would use uh, a lot of sled work. Then I do some basic, basic, a lot of dumbbell work at your age. If you haven't done much weight training yet. Start out with lots of dumbbells and, um, you know, exercises like that and pull-ups and so forth just to condition yourself. And, and at the same time, keep, keep doing some wrestling. The, uh, do not do weights like squat, bench, deadlifts with moderate weights, like eight or ten repetitions uh, with moderate weights. All you're going to do is bodybuild. You're going to put on muscle that's not very appropriate for sports. You want to just get stronger and, of course, stay in the lightest weight classes. So that's the biggest mistake in a lot of, uh, in, uh, you know, combat sports and running, all right? So stay away from that. Just, uh, just get strong and a lot of jumping. So Carlos follows it up with, what exercises would you recommend for explosiveness in jiu-jitsu? Well, that's a, a one for the legs jumping. Um, if you're if you're in good shape, uh, now back to Carlos, he's 14 years old. I'd probably maybe recommend only 24 jumps twice a week. For more advanced, it would be 40 jumps twice a week. For the super advanced, um, you could do 120. That would be 40 jumps three times a week. Always change the type of jumps you're doing from kneeling jumps off the knees to sitting on a box at my second box using kettlebells, ankle weights, weight vests, combinations. Always move it around. Uh, to adapt to training is to never fully adapt. So never adapt to training. 
Like if Carlos and I wrestled, and once I figured out his number one move, he could never be able to put that number one move on me again. He would have to get an more advanced move. All right. And so uh, you always want to uh, never uh, fully adapt to training. Constantly switch. That's what the conjugate system is all about. It's also bringing up weaknesses. A lot of grapplers, especially jiu-jitsu, have weak lower backs and hamstrings. You see a lot of American wrestlers that can handle jiu-jitsu guys, you know, and that's the problem. They're just they over muscle. I used to watch Pride all the time, and all the Americans actually would just run right through the poor Japanese, and they were putting on the show. And the reason was they were just stronger. Next one comes from Dave. Dave asks, do you find it best to include explosive work on max effort and dynamic effort days or devote separate sessions to it? Hi, Dave. If you want to talk about contrast training, it really doesn't matter. I mean, if you want to max out and do jumps, uh, my friend Paul Childers uh, set a lot of world records in 308 squat. He would do jumps before he squatted as a warm up. Um, and then other people will jump the day after where uh, you, you don't have any. Uh, Muscular soreness setting in yet. Judd Logan was a four-time Olympian in a hammer throws. And Joe told me that he would max out the next day do his jumps. So I found it really doesn't matter when you do your jumps, especially if you're in shape. If you're having trouble on some day, I believe your work capacity is low. You got to bring your work capacity up. And don't forget about um, upper body work as well, med ball throws and so forth. You know, I'm, I, I'm not so big in med ball throws. I'm, I'm more bigger in ballistic benching with maybe 95 pounds and things like that. So, uh, you know, I know a lot of guys do med balls, but then again, they're not super strong. Next, it comes from Noah. Noah asks, what is a good alternative exercise for reverse hypers? My gym doesn't have a machine for that. Um, I know. One thing I would do, I would do light, ultra high rep good mornings. Uh, I'm 71 years old. And last night, I did 100 reps with about 125 pounds continuously in the good morning. I've done 200 reps continuously. So I like to do a lot of high rep good mornings. Uh, you never have to go down below parallel or anything because once you get too deep in the good morning, you shut the lumbar, you put the pressure on the lumbar to take it off the spinal rectus. All right. So I would do a lot of high reps. Also, I would do alternating one foot in front of the other good mornings. All right. You know, in other words, like split style, you could do a rep like that and a rep like this. Um, I, I trained with a, a bodybuilder I did not actually in the same gym years ago. He would do 100 rep good mornings. He would do a four of a good morning, one off to the right, left, and then one off to the right, one in the front, one to the left, one to the front, one to the right, until we did 100 reps. And I always thought that was, that was a pretty good variation of a good morning. And uh, because it's going to build up your obliques, which are more important than erectus abdominis or inner abdominal uh, pressure. And it's building up the, the lumbar spine and your spinal rectus. All right. Next one comes from a gym, Oxblood Fitness. And they want to know how often, if ever, do Westside lifters wear squat suits and bench shirts as well as knee wraps and elbow sleeves? Is it just competition? Is it just before competition? Is it max ever? Is it just Diane Blower? What's the protocol for that? All right. We always wear briefs when we're doing our speed work because it's pretty heavy. Actually, now our, our average weight is is uh, 80 percent we're doing 80 85 and 90 percent but uh the only time they put a suit on is when they do the circumax phase and actually i've got groups right now doing the circumax and just briefs and they're making tremendous progress all right and i'm i'm talking lots of band tension 375 pounds of band tension for a lifter that squats 300 or 725 pounds and um, a bench shirt goes on about once every third or fourth week is all we wear them. Right now, though, I don't have any sensational benchers except Dave Hoff and uh, Wes McCormick at 165, 615, and Dave did 1015. So, um, but uh, never knee wraps. We never use knee wraps on box squats. It's, it's, it defeats the purpose. And if you wear a canvas suit, for instance, a canvas suit is like a box. Set, it, you actually literally it's like setting on a box. So we don't we don't do that. Just basically in briefs. All of our spatial exercises, you know, in without briefs. Next one comes from David. David wants to know, hey, I'm following Prevalence chart. How do I know if I'm doing too much or not enough? <laughs> well, Dave, if you're following Prevalence chart, you should be just fine. You know, at 80%. Um, you know, just at 70%, the reps are 3 to 6 if you look at the chart. The number, the top list are 24, the minimum is 12, and optimal is 18. So if I was you, I don't know how old you are, 
But I, I would do I would do the 18. I would train optimally and then really push the small uh, special exercises. I I know um, uh, our stat guy did a, a survey and 80% uh, of our training was small exercises, only 20% for barbell. I would follow that. Follow exactly his chart. Now, if you look at the Bulgarians, though, because I started doing a lot of pushing up the percentages and we're doing the same amount of lifts, but with 90%. Actually, we're doing 20, 20, 25 lifts at 90% and we're having good success with it. You know, the Bulgarians, if you look at Nam Suleiman's training, it was a typical Bulgarian training. He, he triple body weight, clean jerk at, at 16 years old. Youngest ever to do that. One day was about 55 lifts at 90 plus percent. The second day, 23. Uh, like on that Monday, it was, it was like 55, Tuesday, 23. Wednesday, 55, Thursday, 23. Friday, 55, uh, and then Saturday, 23. So you see, they did enormous amount of lifts over those percentages. So I figured, what the hell? There's no way we can't do, you know, 25 squats and, and 20 deadlifts like that. And we're doing it, and it seemed to be working fine. Next one comes from Justin. Justin has two questions. His first question is, what would cause someone's seated box jump to be higher than a traditional standing box jump? Uh, it could be actually, I believe, deformation because when you sit on a box, you, you, when you when you jump off the ground, you have deformation in the feet, just like when you run. But if you sit on a box, like that's why we box squat, you have deformation in the up in the upper hamstrings, glutes, and hips. You could be getting greater deformation, which causes greater reversal strength, which in turn would cause you to jump higher. His second question is, how would you go about fixing oversized and incredibly tight hip flexors? Uh, you're going to have to stretch. Uh, one thing, I, I had a female athlete here. Her hips moved eight degrees when supposedly they're supposed to move 40. Uh, the ART guy didn't seem to be able to do anything with it. I had her do Ukrainian deadlift, stand on two, two plyo boxes, deadlift with a kettlebell between her legs in the front and behind her back. Uh, in about two months, it took her hip mobility to 44 degrees. So that's one thing I would do. Also, hurdles, hurdles stretching. You know, uh, like a track squat, put one foot on a box and then squat down and that will stretch out your, uh, you know, your hip flexors. But you're just going to have, and possibly maybe go to a, uh, an ART guy or a rolfer. Have someone work on the muscles itself. You know, dry kneeling. There's all kinds of ways you can get it done now. All right, next one comes from Elvis Erickson. And he wants to know, how would you set up long distance stuff as in running and cycling, say like a two hour bike race? Um, I'm going to talk about this in my next podcast. Can I answer it then? Sure. Or do I have to answer it now? Well, it'd be nice to answer this question at least in short now. <clears throat> Elvis, if I was going to run a marathon, uh, the first thing I would do, because everyone wants to do, I don't want to expose too much of my next podcast, but everybody, if he weighs 150 pounds, he runs a marathon, they do a body weight, they use the same freaking time over and over and over. It's a law of accommodation, it's death on their damn foreheads, because the coach don't know any better. Uh, one thing I would do, I would use weight sleds, and I would do intervals, maybe four intervals of 30 minutes, all right? And then I would try to increase the interval up to 35 minutes and reduce the, the rest time in between. I would use three different weights, maybe 25 pounds, 45 pounds, and 65 pounds. Keep records with those weights because once you uh, uh, are able to break your records with those weights, you should certainly be able to break the records in the normal running because basically all it is is work. Um, you know, a distance is run is work. Uh, and how can, if two people do the same work, the most powerful one will do the work faster or run the race faster. So that's what I would do. Same thing for biking. I had a girl was third ranked in the Olympic triathlete here in America. It was all sled drags. I would put her on a non-motorized treadmill her, and get her heart rate to 155, set her outside, and she would go up to two and a half miles sometimes, never let her heart rate exceed 185. And I asked her, what made you run faster? She said, the, the sleds. Uh, what made you uh, uh, swim faster? The sleds. What made you bike faster? The sleds. It's all about the sleds. The only thing else we did for for swimming was uh, a lot of straight arm pullovers and tricep work for arm motion through the water, and that was it. So I hopefully it listen to my next podcast on how to increase running time, and I will really get into this. All right, next one comes from Justin. Justin says, "Hey, I trained at Bolt Gym. I, I can't use bands or chains there. How should I set up my speed days?" You just have to use the normal weights. 
just straight use pearl of the chart. Um, like, I, like, you know, I don't know if you're a beginner, I would go a seven, a 75, 80, 85. If you're more advanced, I would try to do what we're doing, 80, 85, and 90%. We're making lots of progress doing this. Um, I had a kid that lifted in a meet maybe three months ago, squatted 80, he just squatted 875 already. And I, and I get another one did 750, did 900. And I can go on and on and on by one way, why we push this 5% up. You know, when motion velocity slows, force increases. And that's why we did it. If the Bulgarians could do it, why can't we do it? And they didn't wear any gear and we're wearing gear. So that's why I pushed it up and that's how they're getting stronger. Next up, comes from Patrick. Patrick says, hey, does Westside ever train at a strict 90 to 95% of one RM for reps like two to five for strength endurance? Um, exactly what I've been talking about. Uh, right now, we're doing, um, I have a gentleman right over here, did five reps at 95%, right? We're handling 90% and doing five sets of five with it. Same thing, if you look at Nam Suleiman or the Bulgarian training, I decided to move it up because they were the strongest weightlifters. So if they were stronger, why were they stronger? They trained actually at least 5% higher, if not more. So that's why I've raised the percent up and we're seen to be having great progress with it. All right. Next one goes from Jeff. Jeff asks, hey, my son's high school football team is only lifting Tuesday and Thursday for the off season and conditioning on Wednesday. Would you recommend for those days as the present lifts to be more like bodybuilding than strength and power focused as you've aged? How old is he? High school, 16. Um, it depends if he's super skinny. Yes, you're going to have to do some hyperpathy work, put some muscles on these kids. I would do a lot of sled drive. The reason I like sleds, it's strength and conditioning at the same time. All right. And also make sure the coach knows how to lift weights. My comment, my, my most concern is with a lot of strength coaches that, did no, that don't lift weights. Uh, they don't know how to do the exercises properly. So if you're squatting wrong or deadlifting wrong or bending wrong, you're going to get hurt. And so make sure you know how to do the lifts. I would do the dynamic method like we do. Look on our podcast, look it up, and that's what I'd have them do. I, I started kids at 14 years old, and at 20, they were open world record holders. All right? So I had, I had a kid that actually at, tw at 14 could bench 135, at 20 could bench 625, raw, at 270 pounds. But he did go from 135 to 270. All right, next up comes from Dave. Dave says, hey, in the federation I'm at, I'm 40 pounds away from the world record in bench. What should I be doing for the volume with my triceps and shoulders in terms of band volume? I'm at 200 to 300 band reps per week right now. Uh, well, if you're 40 pounds off the world record, you need more maximal strength. You're trying to achieve a maximal strength record, and you're right on track with all these light weights for soft tissue training to make sure you don't get hurt. Push, add weights to your dumbbell extensions, your barbell extensions, all your extension work. Uh, concentrate on seated and uh, incline pressing, and um, do plate raises. I don't know what you're doing. It's hard to say, but you need an enormous upper back. So do a lot of upper back work. And, and if you're doing 45 pounds in the, in the front raise, we'll say, strap a 10 to it, so you're doing 55. Then put a 25, so you're doing 70. And push up those weights on all these spatial exercises. Those are the ones that will bring your, your classical lifts up, is the spatial exercises. A lot of weighted push-ups. You look at all these guys in America that are these 700-pound raw benchers. Every single one of them do about 400 push-ups a week. And I've, I've pushed this and pushed this for years, but people are too lazy and don't like to do them. Maybe they think it's too simple. But, you know, if you don't have basics, you don't have anything. And um, so try a lot of push-ups. And I always like weighted push-ups. Uh, that Mons, if you look at him, he bench 500 raw and 705 of his shirt at 165. You see him all the time. He do a lot of um, close grip push-ups with weight on his back on a plyo box where it's sideways. So it's all arm, real close grip. Years ago, uh, uh, all the guys I knew, they did lots of heavy push-ups, including everyone in my in your Westside Barbell years ago, and they, we had tremendous benchers. The push your assistant up. Okay. Next one comes from Stefan. Stefan wants to know, hey, I've seen Westside lifters training maximal at 25 reps, so with the new foot, the 5x5 the five five way. Should newer lifters, intermediate lifters and such, train at a more optimal range around like the 16 to 20 rep range doing doubles? to get the form down. Now here's the key with the repetition of fives. If you can do the fifth rep as fast as second, you might as well do five reps because you're going to have greater muscle tension. 
All right. If the barbell slows down drastically, no, you can't do five reps. We have no trouble doing that. Like I've got to say, I've got a gentleman sitting over here and did 95 percent for five reps and the barbell looks just fine. I took a girl. I raised the band tension up to where uh, it was. She was training at 93 percent and she had a 660 squat. Well, now her squat is 725. So the band tensions dropped back down to about 85 percent, if I recall. So you see, as your maximums go up, the band, the percentages is going to go down when you use this extra amount of band tension. Uh, so um, uh, just to answer your question, if you can do five reps, as fast as third rep, do five reps. Uh, my guys, they got lazy ones that don't want to do it, and I've got motivated ones that do it, and they got no problem. Our next one comes from Jonathan. Jonathan says, hey, Louie, my gym doesn't have any decent anchor points for band work for banded deadlifts. I'm wondering if you've ever worked with anyone who doesn't use a deadlift platform per se, or are there any percentages you would use for straight weight for a deadlift on a dynamic or speed day? Hi, John. Uh, one thing, if you don't, if you can't use bands at all, I would, the average training weight you should use is 80%. All right. And, uh, but always pay attention to all the space structures. That's going to take care of your sticking points. But if you don't have a band platform and you want to do it and you have a lot of heavy dumbbells around the gym, place dumbbells, hook the bands around dumbbells, one in the front, one in the back on each side. Then that way that will hold the bands down. Okay. Next one comes from Alan. Absolutely. Excuse me, Matthew. Comes from Matthew. He says, I, I'm a current the BJJ athlete. I love lifting as well. I'm having troubles with my AC joint. Do you have any advice to keep my shoulder improving whilst I'm still training, gaining strength and rolling? Yeah, you got a lot of problems with that and labor and problems. Um, I would do a lot of raises, front raises, side raises, rear delt. One of my favorite things for shoulder stability is just, just uh, ugly looking dumbbell power clean like this. I just rip them up. Just. I don't care about the form, but I let them go back as far as I can get them where I have a tremendous contraction in the upper back. But it's, it's, you're, it's a pull, so you're using your traps and your, and your shoulders, and then it's back. So I would do high reps, like, you know, I, lightweights, I'll do fit, a set of 50 reps, you know, with maybe 25 pounds, maybe 30 pounds. I'll do a total of 50 reps in one set. And that blows me up, and it keeps me pretty healthy because I'm old. Uh, do a lot of push-ups, a lot of push-ups. Last one comes from Alan. Alan wants to know, what are the best shoulder exercises in your opinion for powerlifting? Alan, uh, if you go back to Jim Williams, had a 675 bench in 1972. He did front plate raise. They were called Williams raises. That's how important it was to him. I, I think front plate raise with heavy weights, as heavy as you can go, maybe in sets of eight. And uh, it can be, you know, it can be a 25, it can be a 35, 45, 100, whatever that means to you. I watched my friend Dave Wannington do front, front barbell raises for 135 pound dumbbell. But you got to have some serious strong reps or riffs, I'm telling you, to deal with a barbell. I always had to use a plate. And Dave was a super heavyweight, the first gentleman to squat 1,000 pounds. And uh, so I do a lot of plate raises. Side and rear delts are very, very important. If you have a strong foundation in the rear and the side of your shoulders, it'll keep your front shoulders from hurting hurt. That's where most people get hurt, front deltoid injuries. But if you're strong in the side shoulder and rear, uh, my friend Gary Sanger and I, you know, along the fourth church, we go to meet and we make five pound jumps in the bench. A guy told us we had to do side uh, dumbbell raises. So we lay on the side on an incline bench and did them like this. We did a lot with thumb down and then knuckles up both ways. All right. And uh, the next meet, uh, both our benches jumped 20 pounds raw. And I, I have to contribute that whole thing to side side raises. So I do a lot of side raises. And uh, also, uh, don't be afraid of doing press behind the head. Uh, barbell press behind the head if you're healthy. You know, the ones that can't do it are not healthy. You're, you're made to have your arms every which way. And so um, do a lot of pressing like that and a lot of raises. Uh, I think that's the main thing. Is, is that what we asked just for shoulder work? Yep. Okay, yes. And that's, that's, that's basically what I would do. Tim. Hi, Lou. What are your thoughts on using the Anderson squat, uh, starting from the squat from the bottom, as a max effort exercise? Thank you, Tim. Hi, Tim. We do a lot of that. You know, I don't know if you see a picture of our gym or maybe on the internet guys put it up. I don't know because they don't get on. But uh, we suspend everything in chains. Call underneath it's either a good morning or a squat. A lot of times, uh, one of the very, very diff difficult things is you set a box in there. So you crawl underneath the bar, pick up pick up the bar sitting on the box where it clears the chains, wait for a few seconds to stand up. That is extremely hard. 
But we do a lot of uh, Anderson squats, like you say, suspended. And mo mostly good mornings, but a lot of times squats. So we do them both. Uh, we always normally use a, some type of a, a bow bar, a 14 inch camber, or safety squat bar. Something's a little bit easier on your neck. Working up big weights. I mean, I've watched um, uh, 770 out of the bottom in the good mornings, for instance. The next question comes in from Leon. Lou, can you explain how bands came into the gym and where the origin was and how they evolved to where they are today? Hi, Liam. It's a good question. Uh, years ago, in the early 90s, or about 90 maybe, or, um, Dave Williams from Liberty University came up to visit me. And he told me he wanted me to experiment with these bands and he would pay me. I said, well, you don't have to pay me anything. I go, what are you talking about bands? I'd, never, I'd heard about them, but I'd never seen anything strong with a bungee cord. And I knew that's not going to work for us. So he told me about uh, Dick Hartzell at Jump Stretch had these bands. It just happened the next weekend, Dick Hartzell came to town to do a basketball seminar. So I went up to the uh, university where, at Ohio State, and there he was demonstrating the bands. And I remember he had a platform, he had a platform back then. And I took two bands, put my shoulder squat down, and I said, I've got to have these bands. That was the beginning of it. Then I did numerous amount of ex experiments. First, we used change for a year and a half. I went to three mates, we made great progress. And I wrote about, but when these bands came, then we switched over to mostly bands. Same thing, three contests in about a year and a half, and we just blew the chain stuff away because the bands contribute overspeed eccentrics, which contributes to reversal strength. And I mean, to this day, we're just getting an enormous amount of uh, work out of the bands. We're just breaking records. This year, we broke four squat records. So, you know, all time squat records. And uh, our 123 just hit a 670 squat. He uh, didn't cut weight, he weighed 129, squatted 700, just for instance. Female squatted 730. And it's all about bands. And uh, Tom, we were just talking about this. Basically, the percentage of the bands is uh, is going to be uh, about 40 down to uh, th about 30, what, 38%. Uh, 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 I raised the bands on speed day from 25% to 40. Why? I slowed the barbell bell down. Why would I do that? Because with the bar velocity slows, force increases, and that's why I did it. It's paid off dividends like I can't believe. When you first met Dick Hartzell, he was only doing exercise via body weight and using the weights or the bands around the body. Okay. Before you took it into the gym, was there anyone else attaching bands to bars? No, that's the first, first thing. If you, if you look at super training, um, and uh, back at the back of the book on page 490 is the book I got, uh, I'm, I'm basically um, clearly for uh, combinations of methods training with bands like uh, Mel Sifnell used bands, chains, ice kinetic machines. He knew I used all this stuff and that's why they credited me in there with it. And I'm going to watch that. I, I mean, I watch the university do tests with 100 pounds of band tension. You got to be kidding me. You know, how much we use? 700 pounds. So the more band you use, the stronger you'll be. And I, I discovered like if two people squat 600 pounds. Is what I'm doing with more speed and what I'm doing with you know, maximal strength speed, slow strength. The, the people that are strongest with a lot of band and can stand up with records, those are your strongest people. Reduce some of the band and, and get a higher ratio of weight. If they beat the other person, they're doing it with speed. I don't think anyone, anyone has ever come up to figure out how you how one lifts more weight or what's doing it. And that's how you that's one way to prove it. When you attach bands to the equipment. There is shrinkage, but it's, they're never loose in the bottom, correct? No, uh, you know, bands work by displacement. So you have to really have a, a strong base. Our base is 12 inches. We choke a band around 12 inches. And so that band is pulling you all the way down on every rep. All the way down, you get tremendous force on the way up. A, a blue band here is 250 pounds at the top. It's a bit over 100 in the bottom. So, you know, when you use two blue down, it's extra 200 pulling you down. And, uh, but we've had this tremendous success. But it's all about, you know, people need to get a fixed book, read about Hooke's Law of Elasticity, read about uh, band, uh, um, elasticity itself. And if you know how bands work, then I think you understand a bit more why they work so well. When you say blue bands are 250 pounds at the top, do you mean each band is 125 or each band is 250 pounds? Yeah, a, a set of bands is 250. 50. Okay. Uh, here's what we got, our green bands is 140, purple's uh, 70. And that's all based on the circumference you tie the band around. Exactly. If you put it around the, can you imagine you put it around the bar, mm -hmm. and then you put it around the plates. 
Put me on the plates, it goes way up. So, when you first got the band started experimenting, how far on the side of maximal to super maximal did you go with the bands to where you en ended up at the optimal levels that we have today? Well, we would use different amounts. Like uh, right now, I've got, I'll get, uh, in the beginning, we used 700 pounds with the strong guys. They do 600 pounds, all right, of weight. And uh, recently, um, my 165 woman, we used 500 pounds of band, and she made 445, all right? And then my, my 181, 165, it's what's 955, uses 640 pound of band, and he made 515. Now, I, I, I haven't broke that ratio down, but probably the, the you know, Wesley with this 515 has got the smallest percentage of that, of that uh, 640. Matter of fact, I got a guy that's got 1050, and he made 605. I mean, it, that was about it. So you could take it from there, that'd be a little bit over 60%. If you just started training, can you start using bands off the way, or can you be too weak to get any benefit from bands? I believe you need to use bands in the beginning because you need to accelerate. You know, Fred Hatfield was uh, called a CAT training, compensatory uh, acceleration training. And um, so, you know, you want to accelerate throughout the range of motion. Fred had a great idea, he's very, very smart. But just with barbell weight, it's impossible to maximize force at the top because of the relationship between posture and, po uh, uh, posture and force. You know, you can stand up a thousand pounds, but you, know, you get squashed in the bottom of 500 pounds. So uh, because of that, it, the th in theory, it was correct. But bands make it possible because you stand up at the top of an extra, you know, more than, you know, three, four hundred pounds of band sometimes. So you, and what bands do makes you very, very fast. You literally try to outrun the band tension. It's, it, you're, it doesn't take your zipper nervous system long to figure out. There's going to be a ton jumping on this bar. I've got, to, I've got to actually respond faster than the bands respond to me. Do you use bands for outside of squat for bench and deadlift too? Absolutely. Uh, it's a basic the deadlift is around 33% on the most part. Then we might put some extra bands on top uh, for the lockout. And then the bench is about 30-35%. Have you ever found that there's a percentage of bands where it didn't justify the means to where it was just too hard to recover from? Uh, well, that's a lot. <laughs> like a 600 pound bench, your dad used uh, purples here. The way you put the purples on is double, you know, doubled up on the bar in a rack that goes down to the ground as well. And that 200 pound of bench was 33%. But my strong guys, Kenny Patrick, George Howard, uh, you know, Tony Bologna, all these guys have no trouble using it. And uh, Gene Restless used to use a lot of beds. Uh, and when he, in going from 900 to 1,000, he was the king. Mm -hmm. He had more 900-pound benches, and he was the first to bench 1,000. He benched 1,010 you know, in uh, York, Pennsylvania. I was, I was actually a referee. No, they, I'm not a referee, but he wasn't a referee. And uh, he used tons of bands. Bands will make you huge. Mm -hmm. They'll get very big. I had Chuck Bogopole one time, because Chuck never had big legs. I said, Chuck, how'd you get your legs a bit? And he said, um, all these bands tension. Because your your earner is accommodating resistance, is maximizing tension throughout the full range of motion. Mm -hmm. A barbell would not do that because of joint angles. He did max effort bench close grip recently. His close grip is 10 pounds heavier than his normal with bench. Do you recommend a wider grip when benching or is it wherever he feels the strongest? <laughs> he close grip more than he wide grip. Yeah. Um, JT, you got weak shoulders. That's all I can tell you. Um, you're going to have to build up your front delts, front plate raise, incline presses, maybe a couple of different angles. Use a close grip and a wide grip. Um, and listen, do two workouts in one day. Well, after you go in and bench, then go through the incline press. All right? And then work up in the incline. I would work up. My, my best steep incline was 370. I'd work up to that. Then, you know, it was on the way up. Then I dropped to 315 for a rep record, 275 for a rep record, and 225 for a rep record. So I got my volume in at the end of the thing. I, I did all singles on the way up and reps on the way down. And so, see, after I would bench, I'd do my, you know, my, all my triples. Then I would do the inclines. Then I would go into tricep extensions and uh, with a barbell. And, you know, that, so I, that's how I did. I did a lot of work. But obviously, your delts are weak. And uh, I mean, there's no way you should close grip more than you should wide grip. Uh, uh, very few people can do that. Very few. And I, you know, you may be one of them, but uh, you know, it's hard to say. You'll be one in a hundred. But um, all, and what what I suggest, what took my bench way up, um, actually, in two years, I went from 340 
weighing 172. Tatetsko, 450, weighing 175 by doing illegal wide benches. Bill Sino, a bodybuilder who won several best chests when he had such a thing in Mr. America's, told me to try that. I was, you know, thin, you know, five foot six, one, 180, and actually 172. So he told me I need to do these ultra wide benches, and I did it, and it worked crazy. And I ended up doing a 500 197. All right, year after when I went up to the 198s, you know, 500 touch you go 197, and um, and and eventually 515 went in 202. So those wides really work for me. But when you bench wide, uh, do a lot of triceps. When you're in close, you still got to work your tries, but you got to go out and work those delts. So uh, push part of your volume into delt work, and you know, not so much tricep work, and and try to get your wide grip bench going. But try those ultra wide sixes. Do six is like, you know, this. I'll just say two and a quarter for six. Next week, um, you know, 235 for six, 245 for six. If you get to 250 and, and you start to stall, go up to eights. Go back from two and a quarter, eight, work your way back up. When the stalls go back to sixes, every time you drop back, I will guarantee you'll break your record for sixes. And I uh, think got to get your delts moving and um, work a lot of lats with the wide grips. It's hard to control your lats when you use a wide grip. So a lot of lats, upper back, all right, and uh, build up your traps. Hope that helps. Last question. <laughs> Louis, you talk a lot about having strong lats to help with lifts and recommend barbell rows as a good exercise. What do you think of pull-ups? I've heard you say lap pull-downs were worthless, but I didn't know, no, I didn't know if you felt the same about pull-ups. Um, JT, I think pull-ups are real good if you did them. I did them, I'd get nothing out of them. My buddy Gary Sanger is a 500 bench at 198. He loved him. He did. I, I watched him be like eight reps, hundred pound play rounds ways. Me, I, I did pull ups, and I made the way I'm built. My arms were doing more pull up than my lats. But you'll just have to try and pull ups. Uh, if you're going to do pull downs, use a very very close grip. Make your lats thick. Don't worry about wide. You're not bodybuilding. You want thick lats, not wide lats. And uh, that'll help you if you do that. But if you do your pull downs, your pull ups, you might want to go do some very close grip lat pull downs for very high reps, all right? You get a big stretch and uh, I, I, I ought to help you. But just stick with the rows and do your, do your pull-ups.